right, good morning. Hello. Um, <laughs> good morning. Um, so my name is Nabil Hussain, and today I'm here to speak about finding the joy and excitement in a surprisingly colonial tech world. Uh, <laughs> Um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the organizers and, and everyone at uh, Xander for all of the work uh, making this conference happen. I, I know from experience that it's a lot of work, and to be honest, it's a really big relief to not do it this year, uh, to just like show up and everything is happening and everything is great, so thank you so much for that. It, it's very much appreciated. Uh, I do actually want to suggest to the organizers, you might consider paying yourselves as well as speakers. Um, but yeah, so this talk, this is actually only the second time that I've spoken at a tech conference. Uh, I think some of you, or I, I know some of you uh, saw my first one at Deconstruct Conf um, in Seattle last year. Uh, thank you. Uh, so th this one is actually very different in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, there's no thesis to it. Like there, there's no, I'm, I'm not trying to make an argument which convinces you of something. I'm not actually um, trying to go to, to like our destination. I'm really just gonna kind of wander through a whole bunch of digressions and I hope that some of them uh, will be interesting, uh, and maybe you can learn something from it. Um, all right. Yeah, so I'm just going to talk about some of the things I've done and how I've found a little bit of ha uh, happiness in the tech world. Um, and I'll try not to be too much of a downer while still you know, sharing my very honest perspective. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so yeah, before I get into it, I would like to just open up with uh, an acknowledgement of the land that we're standing on. Uh, what we what most of us call or know as New York uh, has long been and still is uh, the homeland of the Lenni Lenape people, uh, the indigenous people here who um, still live here despite uh, forced relocation, um, all kinds of, of uh, violence that was perpetrated against them. Uh, and I do think that this relationship is uh, important to acknowledge um, because I want, like, I know that Bang Bang Con, for the most part, is specifically about computing, um, but I do uh, want to kind of keep going the theme of the title of uh, an entire tech world, and I use the word technology in a very broad sense, right? Like writing is an ancient technology, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to put our uh, computing relationships into that context. So um, the question of like how it came to be that uh, New York is a tech hub and New Jersey ho hosted Bell Labs and all that is very much caught up um, with the settler, colonial, capitalist, and imperialist uh, history. And I, I think it's, it's very hard to avoid that when zooming out to a broader perspective. Um, but yeah, this, this talk in a lot of ways, uh, I kind of view as like a chance for me to just acknowledge um, the community, which, which has helped me um, just live the life that I live, which is a pretty good life despite everything. Um, and yeah, I, I just want to say how much uh, it means to me to be uh, invited back uh, to this stage. Um, so thank you so much to the organizers, Erdi, Julia, uh, Ahmed, Emily, Alicia, thank you all so much. Uh, it, it means a lot to know that my perspective uh, is valued, even though, like I said, I haven't actually um, been in the habit of making a lot of talks. Um, I'm more used to kind of standing behind the scenes, and it's very uh, unnerving a little bit to be out uh, in center stage, but I really just wanted this talk, compared to the one I gave in Seattle, to be a little bit less of a performance, which is very much how I approached that last talk, and a little bit more of just like a chat, you know? Like, I'm here, this is my hometown, I've been coming to this conference uh, for years and doing work uh, to help make it happen. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is really a love letter uh, to my community, both you all in this room, uh, folks watching on the live stream, you know, hey mom, hey to my friends, uh, if, if you're on there. Um, and it really, uh, yeah, y y you know, I, I try to use Ubuntu sometimes, you see, I'm not using it today. Um, but like the original meaning, I mean, there's different ways to translate it, I understand. Um, but yeah, I think I am because we are is, uh, yeah, something that, I find very fitting and appropriate for um, just how I came to be here. Um, so in the last few years, I've kind of fallen out of doing programming uh, either for fun or for work. Um, but I've been basically doing like one project for fun every summer, and I definitely think that uh, Bang Bang Con is one of those things that kind of hypes me up and gets me excited about the field again. Um, so I'm really looking forward to all the talks uh, that are coming up. Um, so. Uh, th those who saw the last talk that I gave know that this was kind of the guiding theme or question that I kept returning to um, when thinking about the relationship between computing and climate change and, and our responsibilities as technologists. 
Um, and I've kept thinking about this question. I haven't been able to stop, like I said, uh, last year. And yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure if they've gotten better or worse. I feel like they just keep getting more and more complex over time as I get older, and I think that's kind of uh, normal and, and hard to avoid. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. I think we all are. Uh, so let's just get into it. Uh, like I said, there's there's no thesis, but there are a few themes. I'm, I'm going to kind of go chronologically in a minute, but I'm going to try to pay attention to some of these uh, as I go. So the first thing, this is something, I'm sure I'm not the first person to think of this, although if you uh, Google it with quotes, I'm not sure if anyone has put it in exactly this phrasing. Um, but I've started thinking a lot about wh what I'm calling the, the universality of provinciality. Like the fact that there's no kind of outside... Uh, privileged perspective, like there's, there's not, um, like to me the idea of having no bias doesn't make a lot of sense, like that's one of the things, uh, like when I engage, for example, in some of the debates about uh, machine learning, it, it's, it's a little bit strange to me, the idea of not having a bias at all. Uh, to me, everything is always situated, relational, uh, contextual, in, inter, interrelated, uh, and yeah, I, I view technology very much in this light, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my own provincial perspective and the ways that I've expanded it a bit while still recognizing that my, my perspective uh, will always be a provincial one. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the infinite richness of scale and structure. I'm gonna use uh, fractals as a simple metaphor to, um, to get into that a little bit. And yeah, I guess one of the things that kind of maybe relates to these two themes is um, like the value of digressions, uh, like how much there is to learn in like the most obscure, arcane, just going really deep into whatever. So I'm just going to do that a few times during the talk and we'll see how you all like it. Um, yeah, what else I got? Games. Yeah, so I love games. I love all kinds of games. Uh, word games, board games, card games. Uh, but I'm really going to talk a lot about video games and the influence that they've had on me uh, since the time I was a young child through now. Uh, and I guess one thing that I also just want to note in terms of just um, some of the broad definitions I use and the way that I think about things, um, to me there's no difference between training and playing a game. Like whenever you play a game, you're always training yourself to do something. And as I look back at some of the games I played in my childhood, I'm like, ooh, like did I really need to be trained to do that? Um, but you know, we, we, all, <laughs> we all learn, uh, yeah, and we, we try to change, we try to change our thoughts, we try to change our behaviors, and we try to change our relationships. Um, yeah, I've gotten really interested in some of the relationships between mathematics and uh, literature, uh, especially just um, the idea of just having consistent definitions and proceeding in like an axiomatic or some kind of consistent way. Uh, I think th it, this is a very rich and broad um, approach. Uh, there's, yeah, there's so many ways to do it. I'll get into like some of the different logics and so forth. Uh, like, yeah, I, I feel like sometimes people speak about like, oh, this is the logical thing. It's like, there's so many logics to choose from. Modal logic, temporal logic, paraconsistent logic, this logic, that logic. Uh, and I wanna, you know, just uh, think through some of those logics and how they connect across uh, what are sometimes considered technical and not so technical, but in my view, actually not very different fields. Uh, and then, yeah, I'm just gonna spend time just kind of zooming around, looking back and looking forward. Um, so some are, those are some of the themes, um, but since I know that not everyone knows me, I do want to just give a little bit of an introduction. And as I was thinking about like how I was, was going to introduce myself here, I thought a lot about uh, most of the time when I introduce myself in a tech context, it's like this quick thing, and uh, I basically only talk about things that I've done in like the last five or six years, but actually um, my childhood was very important to developing the person I am and, and the things that I care about and believe and do. Um, so I'm not gonna tell you all about everything, but I will just give you uh, a little bit of an overview using prime numbers just so that I don't have to go through all the years. Uh, so the first prime number is two. Uh, so here's a picture of me. I might have actually been one in this picture. I'm the little baby. Uh, that's my older brother uh, holding me when I was a little baby. Uh, those are my parents. Uh, my mom is African-American and my father was an immigrant from Egypt. I grew up with both of them and with my brother in Northern Virginia. I lived on a street called Patience Court, as my parents loved to remind me whenever I wanted uh, anything. Um, so I did learn to wait, I think, eventually. Uh, when I was three years old, I was still a baby. I'm not gonna go too much into that. Uh, but yeah, by the time I'm five years old, uh, I was starting public school uh, in Northern Virginia. I went to a few of them around um, Fairfax County. And I didn't understand it this way at the time, but looking back, it's overwhelmingly uh, uh, clear to me that 
I was receiving an extremely colonized education. Um, the, the history of the US was always presented uh, in a very heroic way. Um, there wasn't really much about my own ancestors, my own uh, experiences. Um, but the thing is that I, I think these educations, they don't always work, but I, I feel like it worked on me and it very much, um, I, I kind of adopted that perspective uh, as my own and it's only in the last few years that I've started to develop a different one and, th and that's the perspective that uh, I think and, and hope is worth sharing in these contexts as well as some other ones that I move in. Um, other things to know about me, when I was five years old, I was already a big nerd. I was already wearing glasses, reading books all the time, getting in trouble for reading when you weren't supposed to be reading, that kind of thing. Um, when I was seven, I started, seven or eight, I was started playing clarinet. Uh, music has been a big part of my life as well. Uh, I was playing uh, Pokemon, I was playing the card game, I was playing it on Game Boy. Uh, and I was also attending uh, religious school on the weekend. I was raised in a Muslim family. Um, so it was pretty much school all the time. It was pretty much public school five days a week and then religious school two more days. So it was, yeah, school School has been a big thing for me too. Um, by the time I'm 11, I'm going to, instead of the closest school, I'm going to like the so-called advanced school, the advanced track. Um, even at a young age, you like I do have, uh, I guess, some awareness of the fact that not all the students are being treated the same, and uh, particularly that there are not very many black students who are being given the opportunity to go into uh, the advanced math classes and so forth. Um, so I had some awareness of that at the time, but again, like in retrospect, especially after having worked uh, as a public school teacher, uh, the, the significance of this is more readily apparent. Uh, and I guess some of the other things that I was doing um, were playing Super Smash Brothers and Zelda for the N64, still playing the clarinet, and at this time, uh, beyond Nintendo, Game Boy, and, and consoles, I had also started getting into PC games. Uh, there's one that had a really big influence on me, on me called Alpha Centauri, uh, which, oh, sorry, I forgot to text for uh, sound. Is there, is there a, so I'm gonna play a little clip. Oh, it, oh, great. All right, so here's our first little digression here. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, it's what's called a, a 4X game, uh, um, where the four Xs are explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. Um, so I think you can already kind of see some of maybe like the problematic or militaristic or violent uh, tendencies <laughs> that uh, some of the video games that I played uh, in my youth or even now um, started to develop in me. Uh, it, it takes place uh, on an alien planet, which is usually just called Planet. Um, it's a really good game. Like, I still like it, I still enjoy it, even as I look back at it with this critical eye now. Um, yeah, there, there's this whole uh, technology tree. So you, you start out uh, in like the not so distant future. Uh, Earth has been basically destroyed by a, a, a vaguely described ecological catastrophe. Uh, a spaceship leaves, it uh, breaks into seven factions, you're able to um, progress within um, this world, and as you go down this technology tree, they contextualize uh, your knowledge of applied physics and, and bulk matter transmitter and, and the hunter-seeker algorithm and all these different things uh, with these quotations, some of which come from uh, characters in the game and some of which are actually from uh, real historical people. And so when I was 11, like seeing these quotes from like Sun Tzu, Art of War, and like Plato's Republic and this kind of thing, this was the deepest thought that was available to me at the time. It had a really big philosophical influence on me to just like read um, some, some of these uh, quotations. And there were also some cool, um, there were also some cool videos that you would get when you finished a secret project. So I'm just gonna show one of them really quick. We must descend. 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 Will we next create false gods to rule over us? How proud we have become. 
and how blind. Sister Miriam Godwinson, we must dissent. Uh, so that was when you uh, finished a secret project called the Self-Aware Colony. Uh, so like nowadays when I hear about like smart cities or something, I'm like, oh my god, it's like Alpha Centauri, it's like this. Uh, of course, all these science fiction things do have a lot of influence on technology, right? Like on our imagination and on what actually gets built, not only uh, on these games. Now, like th this game, uh, like the, the character who's just speaking, Sister Miriam Godwinson, um, it's kind of like a, it's basically a religious fundamentalist. Uh, like, there's a lot of stereotypes in the faction depictions in the game, a lot of Orientalism, for example, in the depiction of Chairman Yang. Um, yeah, I mean, you can hear, uh, she just used a little bit of ableist language there. Um, but like the, and yeah, the, I, I also feel like one thing about these games, and uh, in, in getting back to the theme of like uh, perspective and provinciality, um, these games very much socialize you to kind of view society from this top-down uh, perspective. Like you're the one who's deciding what is uh, the social system that gets that gets used. What what is the colony? Where is the colony going to go uh, next to the xenofungus or whatever it is? Uh, and like as I started to um, develop my political thoughts, uh, I was influenced by this in a way that I didn't even uh, realize in, in terms of just like how I saw my own position uh, very inaccurately, basically. Uh, so anyway, that's the end of that digression. Uh, when I was 13 years old, um, by now I was taking intro to computer science. Uh, so in 2002, when I was 13, um, the public high school in Northern Virginia already had computer science. So you know, lucky for me, that definitely set me on a path that a lot of people um, were not able to go down. Uh, I also started studying Taekwondo and martial arts and, and that kind of thing, which is fun. Uh, by now I'm playing Morrowind, another classic video game, uh, playing Halo, uh, a, a very violent first-person shooter video game where you're shooting a lot of aliens. Um, I was playing chess, still do. Started reading about the history of Zero. I don't know if anyone knows that old Charles Seif book, uh, Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea, but it's one that influenced me a lot, just the idea that something which I took for granted so much actually had a history behind it. and. Um, he actually does go in a fair bit to, um, the author of, the, of this book does go in a, a quite a bit to uh, the Indian and Arabic origins of Zero. And it was kind of um, one of those first things kind of pushing back against uh, more or less what I received in public schools, which is that Europe was the only place that had ever produced any mathematics or any really any culture at all. Um, by now, like I said, this is 2002, 9-11 uh, has happened, uh, you know, I have an Arabic name and I come from a Muslim family, uh, people started to treat me differently at school and around, it was kind of uh, the beginning of my political consciousness, but it was still very much um, establishment oriented, I was very much like, oh yeah, the Democrats are going to come in, they're going to stop the Iraq war and they're going to do things like this, um, and yeah, eventually I saw that they did something else. Um, so I want to go on like a real digression, like a digression of a digression. Uh, about what are called the 36 lessons of Vivek. Um, so this comes from Morrowind. Um, so Morrowind, uh, Morrowind, for those who don't know it, is an open world r role playing game. Uh, you create a character, you have a lot of control over what that character looks like in terms of race, gender, uh, and so forth. Um, there's not like loading screens or anything, you're just kind of walking around this whole world. Um, it's part of the same series as Oblivion and Skyrim. It came out a little, uh, it came out a while before in 2002. Um, and in the game, there's hundreds of texts that are scattered throughout the game. Notes, letters, books, including religious texts for the religions that are made up in the game. And I mentioned that I'm like a big nerd and I loved reading, so I'm sure a lot of people, maybe most people who played the game probably didn't actually care about these books, but I spent a long time just sitting in this video game just reading these books. Uh, and they still, uh, they still influence me, so I'm, I'm going to give a huge spoiler. So sorry to anyone who hasn't already played, uh, <laughs> who has already played Morrowind. Um, but in the game, you, you as the player, the, as the player character, you play as the reincarnated version of a legendary hero named Nerevar, uh, who's one of the main characters of this series of religious texts, the 36 Lessons of Vivek. Vivek is another character in the game. Uh, he's a god, uh, but he was born immortal, and it turns out uh, that he actually got his godhood by betraying and murdering you. Uh, so you don't know this when you start, uh, and probably a lot of people don't even know when they end because they didn't spend all this time reading all this, um, but I did, and <laughs> um, 
it, it's it's really an amazing text. Like the it, it's it's actually quite incredible to just think that you know Bethesda Softworks or whoever decided to just pay someone to spend all this time just coming up with this and writing this. Um, Michael Kirkbride, I believe, is the name of the author, and he really um, yeah he re he really goes in. He has some great. I'm just gonna read uh, one quote of like one of the stories, which must have been made up because in in the in the the book, the religious book in this game is like full of all these like made up lies. Uh, like, in fact, Vivek, who betrays and kills you, was your servant. Um, but, like, in the text, he's, like, you're his servant, basically. And, like, there's this quote where it's, like, uh, you wanted to find Vivek, your lord and master, and find him of all places in the temple of false thinking. There, clockwork shears were taking off Vivek's hair. A beggar king had brought his loom and was making of the hair an incomplete map of adulthood and death. And I was just like looking at this imagery like, wow, like he's just sitting there, these like magic scissors are cutting his hair and an incomplete map of adulthood and death is, is being spun up from it. It's an image that stayed with me for a very long time and I'll come back to it later in the talk. Um, but anyway, now I'm 17. Uh, I had taken most of the math and computer science at my high school by the time I was a senior. Uh, at that time I had started to get into like Linux and I thought it was really cool to like use Linux and to install drivers. I loved installing drivers and installing stuff like I was, I was, I, I thought, I used to think that thing, that kind of stuff was really fun. Uh, I became uh, a fan of hip hop and especially um, one of my favorite artists who I still listen to. I'll also return to this a little bit later. Uh, is the artist MF Doom. Uh, my older brother introduced me uh, to this artist. Uh, I was playing jazz piano and saxophone by now, so I'm, you know, I'm starting to get a little bit more cool than like the early clarinet days and so forth. Um, and I was spending a lot of time on Wikipedia, which has also contributed to both some of the factual knowledge at my command, but also the colonized perspective that I'm still trying to learn to undo. Uh, a lot of European philosophy in particular, both analytic and continental, uh, and trippy math about infinities of different sizes. Uh, so I'm going to take one more digression here, and I'm not going to give the full proof, but I really can't resist. Um, I, uh, I really recommend everyone who, who has, isn't familiar to look up the full uh, Kander's diagonal argument uh, later on. But it's basically a proof uh, that some infinities are bigger than others, and the way that it proceeds is by contradiction. So suppose not. Suppose that you were able to put all of um, the numbers, even let's just say between zero and one into a list. Like imagine that there was a decimal point before all of these numbers here. Um, and then what this construction is doing is basically just saying uh, for each, and this is the binary representation, so it makes it even more elegant. Um, it's basically saying if the first number has a zero in the first place, choose the opposite, choose a one in this new number that we're constructing. If the second number has a one, choose a zero in that slot and so forth. Basically, as you go down this list, uh, ch choose the nth digit so that it will differ from the nth number. And in this way, you construct a new number which does not appear anywhere on the list because it differs from the nth number in the nth place. And so what that means is that even just between zero and one in this tiny interval, there's actually uh, more real numbers or decimal numbers than there are natural numbers if you start counting from zero, one, and just go on to infinity forever. And when I was a teenager, this was like the most mind-blowing thing I had ever heard of. I was like, this is amazing, this is incredible, how could infinities be different sizes? Um, and this is one of the main things that led to me studying math uh, in college, which is where we are now. I'm 19. Uh, I first moved uh, to New York in 2008 to go to NYU, uh, where I studied math and computer science. Uh, I worked at an elementary school for all four years that I was a college student, uh, which is really the best thing for me, working with these six-year-olds. They're like so funny and, and honest and, and great. Uh, yeah, I miss working with little kids. Uh, and at that time, I was volunteering with the College Democrats. Uh, so I was born in 1989. By now, we're in 2008. Uh, Obama was running for office. I was volunteering for him. Um, you know, really, yeah, I thought he was going to do something different. Uh, later on, I thought something else. Um, so by the time it's four years later, uh, I did graduate from NYU uh, with this degree. Actually, I started out thinking about physics, but uh, math and computer science is what I finished in. Um, I joined uh, Teach for America in rural Arkansas, an organization I don't actually have a very high opinion of now. Um, and uh, it was hard. It was really hard to move so far away to receive uh, so little training before being put into a very difficult uh, school and, and teaching situation. Uh, and the year was also very difficult for me uh, because my brother passed away um, in that year uh, by suicide. Uh, it was the farthest from home that I've ever been. Uh, like from here, I can still just kind of go see my mom on any weekend by taking the bus. Uh, from there, I was very far away. I didn't make it to the hospital to see him in time, although I came 
soon as I could, uh, and it just became a very uh, depressed time uh, for me. Uh, so, yeah, I have a lot of regret. I think about the things that I could have done differently, um, the ways I might have had a better relationship uh, with my brother. Uh, but yeah, one of the things that we did share, like I mentioned, uh, MF Doom and uh, video games, like we used to play a lot of games together. And here's maybe a clip that some people might remember. <laughs> The message just repeats. Regret, regret, regret. Catch it. Regret, regret, regret. Halo 2. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, maybe another just really quick digression. Uh, I'm not sure if, like, some of, some of the metaphors that we use, like, in machine learning, right? Like, another name for error is regret. Like, you're, you're trying to minimize your regret. Like, the, the less that you regret over time, the more that you've learned. And that's a metaphor that I actually uh, find a little bit useful in my life. I feel like I regret a lot uh, because I've learned a lot. And it doesn't necessarily have to come with guilt or shame. Um, I do feel like the weight of it does slow me down sometimes, but I also feel like maybe I don't need to be in such a hurry all the time. All right, so now we're almost to where I am now. Uh, so 29. So yeah, so now I'm just going to kind of kind of conveniently like breeze through a lot of the stuff uh, that I would normally maybe spend more time on introducing myself in a tech context. Um, so yeah, I went to Recur Center twice. Uh, when I was 23, that was 2012. Uh, I went to Recur Center for the first time in 2013. I moved back to New York from Arkansas. I've lived here ever since. Uh, 2013 is when I first met uh, Ertie and uh, Julia and uh, Lindsay and, and a lot of the other, uh, Alex, uh, uh, Maggie, some of the other organizers, Emeritus, as, as well as people who are organizers now. Uh, I was really into Haskell and like programming language theory and compilers and interpreters and that kind of thing. Uh, my first time, and then uh, I went back again in 2016, uh, like met Emily, uh, I think by then I must have known Alicia, I don't know exactly when I met everyone anymore. Um, but yeah, so that was my initial connection to Bang Bang Con. I was not one of the founding organizers, but I have been, uh, I was one of them from 2016 until last year. Uh, so I worked for a medical startup and I worked for Khan Academy, so that's what I was doing for work for most of the last uh, five or six years, um, but I don't do that anymore. Um, when I quit, uh, that job last year when I was 29, uh, in February, I started at a place called the School for Poetic Computation, uh, which is also having their showcase this weekend, so maybe come check it out. Uh, I work there, so I'm going to have to kind of be running back and forth between there and here. Uh, yeah, it's an artist-run tech school. It's a cool place. I definitely, yeah, I recommend checking it out if you're not familiar with it. Um, since then, for money, I've mostly been doing uh, freelance teaching. Uh, I also do some writing and speaking and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I am a police and prison abolitionist. That's kind of the political orientation that I'm skipped a lot of the events uh, that led to it between the age of 23 and 29. Um, but yeah, I, I do just want to take a quick minute to plug um, this campaign, No New Jails NYC. I'm not sure how many people know that the New York City government is trying to build four new jails, uh, but I'm against it. And you can talk to me for a very long time about why uh, when I'm off the stage. Um, so last year, I started applying for PhD programs, and I got into uh, two of them. Um, I'm going to be starting at uh, NYU back again. I kind of feel like I'm coming full circle. Uh, this time, though, I'm going to be studying in the humanities. I'm going to be studying uh, media studies. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm still going to be studying computation, but kind of from the other end, so to speak. Uh, although, again, uh, and I'm going to come back to the opening uh, in a moment, I don't really agree with the kind of uh, dichotomy or division between different types of knowledge. I think uh, actually about like this ancient quote from the Rig Veda that uh, truth is one, although the sages know it variously. Uh, and even when I was just applying and thinking about like what kind of programs um, would suit like my proposed research in the relationship between computing and climate change, it felt very arbitrary in terms of which ones to apply to. Like I, I had also applied to uh, the geography program at CUNY. Um, which is where geography is considered uh, like a link between natural science and social science. Um, but like, meanwhile, geography is considered different from history, whereas I had studied physics and there I was like, time and place are the same thing. I was like, how are you separate? I was like, how are you coming up with this separation? It seemed very strange to me. Um, but anyway, that's how you have to do it if you want to work in that realm. So I'll accommodate myself to some extent. Uh, and also last year, a big thing uh, was that my mom moved. Um, my, my father also passed away during the time between I was 23 and 29. Um, so yeah, so this is pretty much where I'm at now. Now I'm 30, so uh, we won't get to 31 quite yet. Um, but yeah, I just want to play one more quick song. 
Uh, this is a song that I've listened to a million times. This is from another game that I played uh, when I was young, and it's actually like one that's helped me a lot with some of uh, like my family situation and other things uh, that I've dealt with. repeated for like 10 hours. There's a video on YouTube, which I recommend if you're just looking for something calm. All right. Uh, so like I said, I just turned 30 earlier this year, uh, and I decided to be 90. So I think I have all these other prime numbers coming up still. Uh, I, I, I like to think about this just in terms of I don't need to rush. Like I've still got two thirds of my time left, and I'm really trying to, to keep it calm and think about all the things that there's time for everything to be accomplished. Um, cool, so now I'm gonna get a little bit more into some of the tech stuff. I'm already most of the way done with this talk here. Um, yeah, so I mentioned uh, how surprising some of the colonial history technology was to me. It's something that I managed to actually get all the way through my education at NYU without really learning anything about. In some ways, it's almost remarkable looking back. I'm like, how could I not have connected some of these things? Um, like, I was studying Arabic, and I was studying computer science, and never, it never crossed my mind, like, oh, why is there not an Arabic programming language, you know? Uh, since that time, actually, uh, Ramzi Nasser, who, who, he, who keynoted here in 2016, created one. Ahmed also uh, created one, and that's been something uh, really beautiful to see. Um, uh, some people really taking up uh, some of these cultural challenges in computing. Um, but still, the military history is something that, uh, for me, is really always present. I think I think about it, like I mentioned, in the video games that I played, like in the, in this other talk you can watch online at Deconstruct Conf, I spoke for a while about uh, like the undersea cables and some uh, that connect, that transmit internet traffic back and forth, and, and the way that that's still controlled um, by imperialist powers today. Uh, and I think that that's something that we in this field really have to contend with very seriously. Um, compared to, I mean, really, I mean, it's not unique to computing in many ways, but I think for people in some fields, there is some kind of pre-capitalist, pre-imperialist history to recover. Uh, whereas in our case, just because of the age of our field is so young, that's actually not the case at all. Um, I started thinking a lot about um, the ways that knowledge production is not neutral. Um, there's and I, I really think there's a reason that uh, powerful industries and capitalists and um, basically like the, the ruling class of people were so determined that computing should be a field that's under their control and not under the control of broad masses of people because there is so much, uh, there is so much power in our field. Um, the, the, the whiteness and, and the maleness of the computer science and math departments, for example, that I was in, I really don't think uh, is a mistake or an accident. Um, and I think that we have a lot of work to do, and I, I'm so glad to be in a room with people who have already been doing this work or are open to starting to do this work uh, of uh, producing knowledge of a different character, of thinking about who is this knowledge for? Who, who is actually going to be able to use the programming languages that we write? Who's gonna be able to play the games uh, that we create? Um, to know that that's not a neutral thing, but that it, it always uh, relates to the broader issues of power in, in the society. Um, I thought a lot about uh, some of the lessons uh, that my ancestors have taught me um, in the, the reading that I've done uh, of people like uh, Amilcar Cabral. I, I can't recommend enough a speech that he gave in 1966 called The Weapon of Theory, which really helped me understand my own position. Uh, in a way, uh, he, he is a type of Marxist, but he doesn't flatten, I think, to the same degree that you might read in like the Communist Manifesto of just 
uh, bourgeoisie and proletariat. He really, uh, he, he actually places a central emphasis on the role of the intermediate classes in that struggle. And I think that uh, we, uh, as technologists uh, who are working people, but who are also in many cases uh, privileged among, uh, above other working people can learn quite a lot. I really can't summarize the speech, um, but check it out. Um, there are other theories that I've learned a lot from too. Uh, I still remember the talk on queer feminist cyberpunk manifestos from a few years ago, that was, that was excellent. Uh, in, in the class where I work uh, at uh, the School for Poetic Computation, I work in the critical theory of technology class. Uh, the teacher there, American Artist, uh, has a whole syllabus which you can check out uh, online. I can post a link. Um, to that curriculum. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, theorists that we've, that we've read in there, like uh, Simone Brown, who's written about uh, the racialized character of surveillance. I think that that's something that uh, could be inserted a lot into some of the debates about like Edward Snowden and, and uh, mass surveillance and so forth uh, today. Um, and yeah, in, in this computing and climate change talk, I spoke for a while about just like the electricity usage of computers, the, the mining uh, that goes into making um, uh, that goes into making the, the the material, like the material, you know, the actual computers, uh, which was something that was very much not on my mind at all when I was kind of studying this abstract math and computer science earlier. Um, but in fact, we're always embedded in that context. Uh, and I, I made a kind of a throwaway comment um, that in this talk uh, that I want to spend a little bit more time on that uh, I consider it a fact of the highest importance uh, that, uh, that you can actually see similar patterns uh, uh, at different geographical scales. So on, in that talk, I very much remained zoomed out at the scale of global north versus global south. Um, but I've been kind of trying to use fractals as a metaphor to help me think uh, through basically simplifying without flattening, to think about the similarities at different scales uh, without losing the rich detail that occurs even at uh, the smallest ones. Um, so here's just a, a really quick thing. Uh, um, I, I'm not gonna assume people know about fractals, although I'm sure many of you do. Um, so fractals are some kind of self-similar pattern. In this case, we see some uh, geometric ones. And there's an interesting question that you can ask of like, how long is a fractal? Like how, how, how long would it be if you just measured it? And it turns out that the answer depends on how long is your ruler. Um, so if you only had a six inch ruler, then you would get this result. But if you had a, a more fine uh, grain, you would start to notice more detail. And there's no actual limit um, to how deep you can take this. So in one sense, you could say that the length is infinite. Um, you can actually characterize fractals by their fractal dimension. Um, you, can consider, um, you can consider a curve like this. This is called a, a Koch snowflake, um, uh, K-O-C-H, I don't know how to pronounce it anyway. Um, but yeah, you, uh, you can consider it to have a fractal dimension which is greater than one but less than two and, and kind of use that as a way to think about uh, how long these things are. Um, so this is a very abstract example, um, but there's a, a famous paper written by a mathematician um, named Benoit Mandelbrot, or however you pronounce his name, uh, called How Long is the Coast of Britain, where he applies this kind of uh, logic to actual geographic landmass. It turns out that countries actually don't have a well-defined coastline length because of exactly this problem. Um, and I've been reading a lot of a book called African Fractals, which gets into uh, some of the cultural design patterns found, especially in West Africa and some other parts of the continent as well, uh, and all kinds of things from furniture to like settlement design and architecture uh, to even hairstyles of cornrows and so forth. Um, so I was just searching around to just see, like, have other people thought about this before me? Like, probably, right? Uh, and I found this like fractal inequality thing, which is very much about what I'm talking about, where uh, you can basically see the um, the inequality at being reproduced at different geographic scales. Right at first, you have the division between global north and global south, between rich uh, rich countries and what are called poor countries, what I would call exploited countries. But the way that that also uh, even happens within a city like New York, the way that you can have such overwhelming wealth uh, and such miserable poverty within less than a mile geographic radius, based on core periphery dynamics. Um, so that's something uh, that I'm really interested in continuing to research. So if you know more about that than I do, please let me know. Uh, I'm gonna kind of just skip past this a little bit uh, and just talk about some of the excitement that I found um, what I'm calling axiomatic theory and empirical practice. Uh, so in mathematics, as you may know, uh, we often start by proceeding by defining a bunch of just really basic uh, axioms and then uh, kind of seeing logically uh, what is derived from them. And I've been trying to use some of this idea, again, as a source of like metaphor when, when I consider, um, 
w like when I consider social topics. Like I've been thinking a lot about summary. My definition of to summarize is to lose information. Um, and yeah, I think that's something is lost, but maybe it doesn't have to be too much. And I think that I think a lot of people sometimes object to mathematical metaphors for that reason because they see what's lost. Um, but I also think that if I just speak in English, <laughs> things also get lost. Like if I talk about the idea of just like weighing up the good versus the bad, I've already implicitly reduced things to one dimension. And so maybe if I can use math to only reduce it to two or three, then maybe actually not as much as lost. Um, like there's, a, I'm thinking a lot about the idea of. Uh, uh, projection, like projection from 3D to 2D, like the way that you can just see X, Y coordinates out of uh, this whole thing, and reducing dimensions. Um, yeah, I don't want to get too much into the translation of programming languages, but yeah, I still find math to be like this really wondrous, like mystical, religious uh, experience. Like I actually organized an event in uh, February called Mathematics as a Religious Experience, which I might uh, do again. Um, and I think it's really remarkable and amazing that the universe seems to be set up in such a way that someone of insignificant power, such as me, can actually have some privacy from you know, the NSA or, or whoever else. I think that, that that must have some kind of uh, social significance, although it's not necessarily obvious to me uh, what significance is. Um, yeah, and I guess just one last uh, quick thing. I've thought a lot about, I don't know if people are familiar with the Pareto principle, but it relates to like power law distributions uh, and like 80-20 rules. Like, the idea that maybe 10 to 20% of the causes account for 80 to 90% of the effects. And then you have kind of this long tail of other things um, that matter maybe a lot if you're in that situation. But yeah, I feel like a lot of times people ask me for advice and it's like, I don't actually know where you're situated. Um, so it's very difficult for me to give advice. Like there are some things like, for example, uh, you, you know, where like I don't have a lot of faith in the general political system. I don't think that that's where most energy should go, but that's not to say that I don't think any energy should go there. It doesn't mean that I don't think you should do it just because I choose not to do it. Um, yeah, so this is another uh, just quick project that I did. I'll just show it really briefly. Um, so I worked on this project with uh, a friend of mine named Sean uh, Katongi. Um, so back in 2013, uh, I, was, I implemented uh, a language uh, I'll call once brain fuck, and then I'll call it BF, just to not swear too much. Um, and it's a very simple programming language. At that time in 2013, I was really intimidated by the idea of implementing my own language. And uh, when I saw how simple this language was, I was like, oh, that's something that I can actually do, basically, even though it's very unfriendly uh, to implement. And then five years later, in 2018, I finally wrote this, uh, working with Sean, wrote this visualizer for it so that you can actually kind of see uh, what's happening. Um, so check it out, there's the URL if you want to just see that. There's sound effects too, so a fun little project. Um, and yeah, this is kind of, as I start to wrap up, this is what I want to uh, end on, is uh, the joy that I found in community. Um, there, there, I, I have so many of these weird thoughts. I've just kind of gone through a lot of them in this really maybe incoherent way. I'm hoping that people will just, uh, share something uh, with me, will just tell me that like some weird throwaway comment related to something else. Uh, like I said, it's summer, I'm almost ready to like program for fun a little bit again after you know being down on it for most of the last year, which is kind of have my usual pattern these last few years. Um, yeah, like I, I made uh, most of these projects, like that last one I mentioned, uh, I made last summer. Uh, this next one, uh, one of the reasons I mentioned Doom before, I made this uh, simple rhyme generator after being taught uh, by Alison Parrish, uh, who I know is here, who is one of my teachers. Um, uh, using her excellent uh, pronouncing library. Um, and it also, yeah, you can, you can check out this blog post where I also think about some of the ways that the military history of computing actually manifests even in this silly project, which is basically that the pronouncing, the pronouncing dictionary was funded uh, by DARPA, the US Military Research Agency. Um, but for all that, like, for all that, I still found so much joy in just working on this project and demoing it at SFPC and going to these classes uh, and being in spaces uh, like this. Uh, even even knowing that history in that context, I think um, it, it doesn't it doesn't take away from uh, from some of the beauty that we're able to create uh, with these tools. Um, this is another example of some of the math I was talking about. This is taken from Simone Brown's book uh, Dark Matters, where she kind of uh, separates the idea of surveillance and surveillance, and rather than considering them as opposed, considers them as independent axes, and comes up with kind of eight. Uh, actually, well, she's, she's quoting um, Steve Mann, 
Uh, and then she actually adds a third dimension. She doesn't illustrate it in the book, but she describes it, um, which discusses the role of blackness in surveillance as kind of the unseen, the unseen dark matter, which actually moves a lot uh, of the things that, uh, that some of these powerful entities, uh, such as the NSA, the police, and so forth, are doing, uh, even though it's not necessarily uh, spoken about. Uh, and when I think about some of this flattening, uh, like here I just have this really long excerpt from an email I wrote to uh, my friend Francis Singh about this, this really wild idea. So yeah, if anyone wants to maybe help me think through how this could work, that would be awesome. Um, for a political physics simulator, where I have this idea of modeling people as like a uh, points in like a very high dimensional space, like maybe having hundreds of things that represent um, their positionality in various categories, maybe some relatively objective like race, gender, wealth, education, some relatively subjective like their, um, uh, like their reported beliefs or some of the past actions that they've engaged, engaged in. And then to try to visually summarize this space uh, using TSNE or principal component analysis or some, or some other dimensionality reduction technique. And think about it like from this universality of provinciality standpoint, of thinking uh, of like where are different people situated and how does the summary, the visual summary, look different from different vantage points despite the fact that we're all actually operating on the same terrain. Um, my hope is that this could be um, somehow a useful simulation. It turns out Francis had actually done some related work uh, in Humans of Simulated New York. Um, but yeah, I have all of these really just wild speculative uh, ideas. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be in this room with so many other people who I know also have uh, some really out there ideas. I can't wait to see uh, all of your talks. And so instead of a conclusion, uh, I just want to ask a few of these questions uh, where like I spoke a little bit about the class character of knowledge, um, where I feel like there's only a, a limited group of people who are able, who I am able to speak about some of these things. And I'm wondering, like, how do we get to a world where that's not the case, where um, we're using all this kind of computational simulation and math metaphor is actually a popular medium in the way that writing is or drawing is. Um, what can video games tell us about making the most of spare resources? I still thinking about uh, Ayla Meyer's talk from before about the fantasy console Pico 8 and the ways that people get all this joy from um, programming against the limited resources of a console, even though that's not actually necessary in many cases the way that it was uh, historically. Um, and I think about the future of climate change and the way that uh, resources might be more spare, the way that we might not be able to just go on extracting things for years and years, you know, getting all these brand new phones just to throw them away in two years. Like, uh, what, what does that process look like uh, as producers? Like, what can we learn from that? And also as consumers, the fact that uh, people's NES from the 80s still works. Like, to me, that proves that planned obsolescence is a plot, you know, that like, uh, electronics could be made to last. The knowledge of how to do it exists because it's been done, um, but for one reason or another, these companies choose not to do it. Um, yeah, I just ask, where do we see ourselves going? Um, you know, uh, I've, I've, I've told you something as much as I could in the short time that I have about the path that I've walked uh, that led me here. Uh, I mentioned I'm gonna be going back uh, into the academy and studying computers from a somewhat different perspective that has its own traps and pitfalls, of course. Uh, I know people in this room are doing all kinds of things, whether as software developers, as teachers, um, just inhabiting this whole tech world in different ways. And I'm just wondering, um, yeah, I just want you to tell me a little bit more about uh, how you see the future, uh, how you relate um, to each other in this room and all of us, just in general. Uh, so I wanna close out with this quote from um, the black trans uh, leader, Martha P. Johnson. I may be crazy, but that don't make me wrong. Um, yeah, I, I know uh, there's been some discussion in past years about uh, like this word, uh, uh, the way that it can be considered ableist. Um, myself, I uh, I don't object to like when people tell me that my ideas are crazier than I am. I'm like, you know what? Like, maybe, maybe I am. Um, but again, it, it doesn't it doesn't mean that the ideas are not worthwhile or that I don't have a place uh, in this community, despite whatever out there ideas I might have. Um, this image is from uh, my friend Vienna Rai. I really encourage you to check out their other art as well. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>